So, uh, I think you've seen a lot of Chris Killam, if you've been here already this weekend, so I don't need to say too much about him. He is one of the great advocates for plant medicines and uh, proper relationships to these medicines, proper relationships to the, to the uh, indigenous sources of many of the medicines, um, and just a good-hearted, generous uh, soul all around. Please give him a big warm welcome, Chris Killam. Hey man, you're wearing my vest. <laughs> we, we, we planned this ahead of time. We wanted to make sure that we looked alike. <laughs> Thank you so much. So good morning, spirit plant medicine folks. Is it, are your brains still swimming in a luminous cannabinoid broth this morning? Yes. Yeah. Did anybody not have enough last night? <laughs> no. It was funny to watch people, you know, very carefully get down the stairs and then afterwards very carefully sort of levitate back up. Before I go any further, I want to thank uh, Stephen and Mark and Andrew and everybody uh, who is part of the Spirit Plant Medicine staff who has made this possible. This is an extraordinary gathering. Uh, it takes an enormous amount of planning and talent and intelligence and creativity. And I'd like you all to give them a rousing round of applause. Uh, secondly, I want to thank all the other speakers. Uh, every one of you makes every one of the rest of us have to up our game. And that's marvelous. That's marvelous. I've listened to some of you folks and go, boy, I better be really good when I get up there after these people. And that's what we do. It's not a matter of pressure. It's a matter of encouragement. It's a matter of all of us rising together. And so I have a great appreciation and profound respect for the work that all of you presenters do and how you share it with grace and intelligence and wit. And I also want to thank everybody else here for being part of this temporary community. And for all the people who come up to me to have conversations, keep them coming. That's what we're here for, is to share, to interact with each other, to enjoy each other's company. As you know, this is the Psychedelic Sermon. I come from a family of broadcasters and ministers. I represent no ismology or osophy. I represent no religion. I'm not pushing any dogma or doctrine. But I do have some ideas. And I want to share those with you today in what I call a psychedelic dharma. And I would like to start out without any explanation at all with a seven minute video that I think sets the scene very well. Welcome back. God does some mind blowing things in my life on a regular basis but there are a growing number of people seeking a spiritual connection who are taking psychedelic drugs containing the compound DMT or the God drug to find divine insights and spiritual growth. One such drug, ayahuasca, and celebrities such as Chelsea Handler, Lindsay Lohan, Terrence Howard, and Sting have all tried it. To get a better understanding of the medicine and the myths surrounding it, we're joined today by Chris Killam. Chris is the author of the Ayahuasca Test Pilots Handbook, and he's here to explain today. Welcome, Chris. Thanks. It's a pleasure to be on with you guys. Glad to have you. Can you please explain to us, we want to engage in conversations. This is new to us. Sure. We believe in talking to all people. Uh, what in the world is ayahuasca? Ayahuasca is a brew made in the Amazon rainforest. It's been drunk for about 2,000 years or so that we know of, made from a vine and a leaf. It is profoundly psychoactive, and people take it in a ceremonial setting. It's not, I, I object to the word drug. Uh, I prefer to think of it as a sacrament, but people take it for healing of physical, emotional, and mental disorders, and also for spiritual insight and revelation. So you object to the word drug, you sacrament, because you said it's holy or divine? Well, it is taken uh, in a manner uh, with great reverence, 
and respect. It's not something they, oh, hey, let's, let's knock back some ayahuasca and go to a fish concert. That's not what it's about, okay? It's just, it's just like, you know, when you have communion in church, that's a special situation with the wafer and the wine or the wafer and the, and the, and the grape juice, whatever. Uh, you don't just, like, knock some back in your kitchen. It's the same thing with ayahuasca. You approach it with reverence and respect. So, and it tastes nasty, by the way. So is it... Is it a part of a ritual of a particular denomination or group? It is a non-doctrinaire situation. Uh, ayahuasca has been used by native people in the Amazon for a long time. Uh, the largest group of people who actually dispense ayahuasca is a Christian church from Brazil called Santo Daime that has millions of members all around the world. And they hold ceremonies in L.A. and New York and Rome and Paris probably every night of the year. So let so, me ask so, you this. Hold on. Let me ask you when you say <laughs> a Christian church, because you, you brought up communion. The difference, though, is that communion does not give you a psychotropic effect. It right. doesn't cause you to hallucinate or to, to see anything. It's more of a contemplative moment where we identify with who we believe is the Savior and his sacrifice. So yeah. that's a little different from taking, you know, the crackers and grape juice, I'm like, oh, yeah, I'm about to feel it, you know. And I'm not saying that it's not sacred. Let me ask you this. But In what if States, you took the crackers and the grape juice and you met Jesus right there? Would that be something that you wouldn't want? Well, we well, don't have to meet Jesus. Right. We have Jesus but, with us all right. the time. Yeah, but, so, no, right. but yeah. let me answer. Let me answer. Yeah, go ahead. For me, <laughs> I believe that... Uh, for me, the question of will I meet Jesus one day when my breath stops, I'll meet him. Yeah. I don't have to meet him right now down here. The best way for me to meet him is the way I treat other people uh -huh. because yeah. the Bible says that we are Christians for our love for one another. Right. My question is the, the psychotropic aspect. Has the Food and Drug Administration chimed in on this as far as in the United States? Or? Ayahuasca is not legal in the United States, even though there are ceremonies every night of the year all over the country. Um, the feds are pretty much leaving it alone. Um, it is typically consumed. Uh, I only drink it in the Amazon. I've been bringing people for about 10 years uh, down there for healing of trauma, disorders that they just can't get rid of with any other means whatsoever. And uh, many of them wind up having profound spiritual revelations. And this is something that people have noticed, you know, um, veterans who just can't get the relief they need from the trauma they've suffered by taking Prozac go down there and often they live better, happier, healthier lives. So I'm, this is a service to people. I, I got to ask you this. You've taken it how many times? About a hundred. Okay. So if in fact you don't see it as a drug yeah. and you're taking it a hundred times, you don't think that it's any level of addiction to it? I never crave it. I don't know anybody who's ever craved it. It tastes too bad to crave. Let me ask you. So, it's so, way so, too bad to crave. So, so, let me ask you, so, so, so the persons that you've taken are persons who've had trauma, who've had pain. What made you take it initially? Uh, I went down because of uh, a very prolonged grief over the death of my mother. I had grieved for way too long. I knew I was in an unhealthy zone. I went down there. I said to the shaman, look, you know, I really want to get rid of this grief. He said, I think we can do that. Very first night. About an hour into ceremony, I'm sitting with my mother, and she says, you know, it's pretty weird that you had to come down here and drink this stuff and throw up in a bucket to get over your grief about my death, but you've always been different, and that's what I love about you. And from that wow. second, 10 years ago, the grief was gone. Call it strange, call it weird, this stuff heals. And you believe you actually saw God, a visions of God. Two years ago, I wound up spending hours completely dissolved in the compassionate heart of Christ, which is an experience I wish every human being on earth could have. So, so let me ask you this question. So is it that the drug helped you to see God or was your mindset? I'm a reverent person by nature and I love to serve people by nature. Um, I had no specific intention of seeing anything at all. Um, whatever occurs, occurs. I mean, look. I understand people respect that 2,000 years ago, Moses saw a burning bush. You're going to see more than a burning bush in your first half hour on your first ayahuasca. <laughs> I bet. And you'll have it for so. yourself. Okay. Well, you know, uh, we, we, we appreciate you coming to explain it to us. It's good to say, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. Sure. My mother just passed away six months, and I'm not going to take uh, any drug to get over that. I'm going to ask God to take that mm -hmm. pain from me, and hopefully walking with God will help me. Uh -huh. And uh, so hopefully you've experienced the, the joy and the peace has, has come your way. But for me, I just, 
I just want to pray to God and hope that my mentality, a positive mentality, yep. and as a person thinks in their heart, so they become. So and I want I to become that. what that is. There are many ways to God, and I respect that. Absolutely. Thanks for coming. Thanks, my pleasure. Thanks, thanks for coming, Chris. Chris. Hey, this go. is Chris. With the preachers, don't change that channel. Thanks. Stay with us. While I have done television since I was a little boy, I have to say that was one of my absolute all-time favorite gigs. Um, yeah, no, these guys were wonderful. Some people have said, oh boy, you know, they're so closed-minded. No, they invited me there. They had the conversation. They were warm, they were friendly, they tried hard. They just got to a certain point and they couldn't go further and that's fine. My, I, my purpose for being there was not to convert them. I am not a missionary. Okay, my purpose was to say, hey, there are like many paths to divine understanding and let's sort of open up the channels. And is it a, a success in terms of any one of them going to try ayahuasca? I would say 100% no. <laughs> but I can tell you that the floor producer, the guy behind the camera, one of the audio people, somebody else who was backstage, they all wanted cards and they all wanted information because they were interested. And one of those persons is gonna wind up in an ayahuasca ceremony, either in LA or in the Amazon because of that, and I consider it mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> Which brings me to the uh, sort of sermonic part of this, I guess. <clears throat> you know, we are a congregation excuse me, we are a congregation and we enjoy this uh, fellowship of many like ideas and basic humanity and goodness and you hear people talk at what they're doing. I mean, counselors who are working with really difficult situations and making tremendous inroads, helping people with their lives. I have heard it said uh, a number of times, well, you know, the way people are using ayahuasca now is not the way it's traditionally been used. right out. This is not hundreds of years ago. The purposes of engaging with these agents have changed as society has changed, as our lives have changed, as our needs have changed. Were there psycho, were psychedelic assisted therapists 400 years ago in the Peruvian Amazon? Probably not. But that makes no difference. That does not matter. The fact is that psychedelic assisted therapy now is saving broken lives. And that's a marvelous thing. Um, when I think about Dharma, when I think about um, principles and practices that have to do with what you could call right living, um, there's no intended dogma attached. I have three ideas for you. One which I hope was at least somewhat well represented um, by that video was carrying the medicine. We all carry it in different ways. Um, some people come back from drinking ayahuasca, from engaging in peyote ceremonies, from iboga ceremonies, from whatever, and people look at them and say, wow, you look great. What, what, what's different about you? What's happened? And carrying that medicine forward in that way as a more integrated, healed person is marvelous from the standpoint of, you know, living example of improvement as a result of a relationship with these agents. And at the very same time, um, you know, we see, <clears throat> we see people using ayahuasca for spiritual discovery. Maybe that wasn't what tribal people were doing a long time ago. They had different needs, they had different purposes. We're different people living in different societies in different times. And so, if we find value in spiritual insight, gained through the proper and hopefully intelligent employment of the psychedelics, whether you're talking MDA or you're talking peyote, that is only a good thing, and it does not matter if that came out of antiquity. The medicines are adaptable, and human beings are adaptable. And it isn't the case that you say, well, you know, you can really only do this sitting on a dirt floor with chickens around, and that, no, that's not true. We can do it any way we wish. 
And then we figure out, well, what are the best and most intelligent and helpful ways to proceed with this? So I, I find, um, I, I speak at a lot of conferences. I speak at gatherings all over the world. Um, most of them are not as just, I mean, this is just, you know, face it, this is love bombing, pure and simple, what's going on here. Just so many people of good faith coming together, so positive, so willing to contribute whatever goodness they have. It's nothing but a pleasure. Uh, a lot of the gatherings I go to, I don't want to suggest that they're all evil, devious people. That's not true either. Uh, but they're not necessarily focused with the same intentionality that we are coming together here. And uh, sometimes I, I speak to large gatherings of cosmetic chemists, okay? And yeah, that may sound a little strange, but I'm a medicine hunter and I travel all over the world and I find stuff that winds up in expensive jars of goo that you buy at Sephora and other places. And so I, I go around the world, I speak to cosmetic chemists, um, and sometimes at, uh, at uh, conventions, I will give a talk, let's say, on um, Amazonian-derived cosmetic ingredients and how they might heal skin collagen, whatever. And then, I'll, and then I'll save about seven minutes at the end. And I'll say, now I want to tell you about something. I want to tell you about something you're not going to do anything about. And you're not going to use in your products and you're not going to do anything with regarding development. And they're kind of like, and then I tell them about ayahuasca. <laughs> so I've just gotten through, here's how you can reduce the appearance of five fine wrinkles in your skin as a result of the judicious application of alpha basabalol. And then all of a sudden I go, so you sit with this stuff, you know, you drink it. Sometimes you got your head in a bucket because you're puking demons out of your belly. <laughs> and they're kind of like, But what's amazing is that for the entire rest of the conference, and it's always happened this way, the people who come up to me, they don't say, you know, I'd like a little bit more information on what you were talking about with Uncaria tomentosa reducing inflammation in the skin. They come up, they say, thanks for talking about that thing at the end. Because something rings true to them. Not everybody has to carry the medicine the way I do. I'm a communicator, this is what I do. I get up, I talk to people. You know, Zoe and I, uh, Zoe's presentation was fabulous yesterday. <laughs> but we have this funny conversation. She'll say, I'm really afraid of getting up there. And I'll say, I like a situation in which somebody runs to me in panic and says, I'm so sorry, but in 10 minutes, we need a speaker who can talk for an hour to 3,000 people. And they go, yes, yes. So that's my dharma. What are the principles that we live by? If we have these benefits from psychedelics, a greater sense of unity, a greater sense of oneness, are there principles that we can then carry to fashion a life in accord with that? And, and by the way, you don't need psychedelics to be a good person. You don't need psychedelics to be a good therapist. You don't need psychedelics to be insightful, intelligent, thoughtful, compassionate, or humane. They just help. And so carrying the medicine can be doing good intentional work with people that makes a difference in terms of their own healing. It can be speaking to people in ways that open their minds to new possibilities. It can just mean showing up someplace and being, well, wow, what the hell happened to you? I want some of that. Whatever it is, people here have experienced all of those things. Um, so. I had a, a, a situation with um, Yves Saint Laurent Cosmetics where uh, I was asked to uh, work with them on a project with Moroccan saffron for expensive goo that you put on your face. And um, they flew in into Morocco, they flew in teams of journalists from Japan, Germany, Spain, uh, the UK, uh, France, a uh, couple other places, and they would bring each group each language group in one at a time and sit with me. <clears throat> so, you know, and it generated about 75 or 80 articles all over the world in the beauty press. But every single group came in and sat down and much to the annoyance of the sort of handler who was trying to always keep the conversation steered toward Yves Saint Laurent and Saffron, they, the, every team, they started out going, you know about ayahuasca? <laughs> and they were like, yeah. 
And so we'd talk about that, and you know, the, the minders sitting there like, you know, but, but they wanted to hear about ayahuasca. So in all of our ways, in the ways that are appropriate to our personalities, appropriate to our talents, appropriate to our interests, I suggest that we all carry the medicine. We all bring that forward. We all keep that in our minds and hearts. It's a matter of remembrance. A second thing I want to talk about is serving others. Um, there are many, many people here serving folks in extraordinary ways, and I, I admire all of you. And I admire all the people serving humanity and serving the world out there who aren't in this room. We need as much of that as possible. Um, I had my first psychedelic serving others at a school dance in boarding school. Now, if you know about boarding schools, they're largely these perverse institutions called preparatory institutions. I don't know exactly what they think they're preparing you for, but I'm pretty sure it's sex and drugs. <laughs> and we had a big school dance. It's a co-ed boarding school, so very dicey situation, okay? This, the teacher is always trying to catch the students going at it in the bushes and blah, blah, blah. It's just kind of the way it was. And some pervy teachers too. It was kind of a mess. But anyway, I was, I, I was known for some reason, and I don't really know how it started, as the go-to guy when people were having a bad experience on some drug. So it just kind of happened that way. I was an early adopter and I sort of knew what to do. And uh, I was at this dance, the entire school was there and the entire faculty, okay? So just imagine a prison surrounded on all sides by armed guards and, and guards patrolling the hallways and the bathrooms and et cetera. And, and somebody came to me and said, Chris, we got a really big problem. Sam is in a toilet stall on acid and drunk. Now you gotta understand, Sam was a super athlete. He was inhumanly powerful. He could literally break all of my bones in about two minutes. He was drunken on acid in a toilet stall, and he would be thrown out of school for sure. At some point, a faculty member would catch him in there moaning and groaning and you know, resting his head against the ceramic tiles, and he would have been gone. He would have been gone. So we had to set up this whole scheme. I went down there and I thought, what am I gonna do here? This guy can kill me. And it's, it's, you know, it sounds funny, yeah, ha, ha, but it's not, it's, it's truly terrifying to get into a little tiny toilet stall with a guy that powerful and weird too. So anyway, <laughs> um, but I thought, I thought somehow, somehow I have to reach a place in this guy. I have to find a place that is safe for him. And then I got to get him out of the bathroom, into the hall, up the stairs, out the door, across campus, into his dorm, upstairs, and into his room, and into bed, and then get back without either of us getting caught or thrown out of school. No problem. So it, it, it required lookouts. It required a relay system of, OK, Chris, the coast is clear. You know, finally, I got to this guy, Sam. I said, you know, I was able to get to him. He remembered who I was. He had no inclination to kill me, which was very, very good news. And it did turn out that I did manage to get him out of there. And I did manage to get him across campus. And I did manage to get him into the dorm. And I did manage to get him into his bed and then said, you know, with a kind of an authoritative tone, stay there, and left. Um, and he didn't get thrown out of school and neither did I. So that was my first experience with actual psychedelic assistance. But there are lots of ways to serve people. Uh, my grandparents, uh, my grandfather was a, a minister in a church in, in Lowell, Massachusetts. My grandmother was maybe the loving, most loving human being I've ever met and certainly my ardent defender and protector, which was always a gas. Uh, one time she gave me, they went to Italy and uh, I think it was 10, and she came back with this cute little thing, and the cute little thing was a switchblade. <laughs> and, <laughs> and when I got it, I just looked at my parents like, you know, I didn't even have to say it. The, 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 the non-spoken words were, you can't take this away. This came from grandma. 
you know. But in any case, um, he, was a, he was a remarkable human being, my grandfather. And um, Lowell, Massachusetts, at, at, during, in the 60s, was the only East Coast location of the Hells Angels Motorcycle Club. Everybody else was in the West Coast, around Arizona, California. Um, and a Hells Angel was killed. Uh, I think it was a 19-year-old, 20-year-old was killed, uh, shot, I believe. And the Hells Angels started looking around for a minister to do a service, or a priest, or an anybody. And by the time they got to the having to say who it was for, all of these people were suddenly busy. Oh, I'm so sorry, I've got to go away. You know, and nobody would do it. And finally, somebody said, I know who will do it. You call Pastor Scalisi. He'll do it. So they called my grandfather. And my grandfather, you know, they, they said, you know, a young man has died and we need a, a funeral service done. He said, yeah, sure, sure, of course. Okay. And the guy kind of hemmed and hawed on the phone. And he said, well, it, he's a member of the Hells Angels, like waiting for my grandfather to, you know, slam the phone. And my grand grandfather's like, yeah. And he said, well, so, you know, they're a motorcycle gang. Yes. Uh, and he said, will you do it? And he's like, yeah, but you need to drive me. Okay. So, because he was a hideous driver. I don't know why he didn't kill himself and everybody else on the road. It was like Mr. Magoo. He was terrible. <laughs> if he was in the passing lane and that exit was over there, he just, he just carom over there. And by some, like, divine grace or something, he managed to survive, and so did everybody else on the road. Terrible driver. We wouldn't ride with him. <laughs> he was five foot two, he was bald head, big nose, a uh, little portly, and he would drive this big mercury. Uh, and, and you could only see his head between the space, between the dashboard and the top of the steering wheel. And when, it was, when he had his hat on, it almost looked like a disembodied driver uh, going down the road. So, so they take him to a roadhouse, okay, a bar, out in the countryside where there are 300 motorcycles. And this bar is filled with Hell's Angels. And they've all got the tats, and they've all got the, you know, the pool cues and the knives on their belts and the whole bit. And many of them are huge, you know. And, and um, here's my grandfather, <laughs> Yale graduate, and he's a minister, and he's in there. Gets up on the bandstand. They all quiet down. He looks at them, says, you guys aren't so bad. <laughs> and they're like, the hell? <laughs> he says, in the eyes of God, all are beloved. Pfft. He had them. It touches me today. He had them. He just didn't care who they were. He did not care what they looked like. He did not care. For him, these were human beings in grief. A brother had died. That was the story. He delivered this amazing sermon, as he always did. His sermons were remarkable. And at the end, as he was leaving, they did the way the Hell's Angels do it. They, they passed a hat, and they, they gave him this enormous wad of cash, which is a classic, like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars. You know, he's kind of like sort of horrified by it, but he took it. And, um, and, and he and my grandmother had you know, not much money anyway. Um, and the, the head of Hell's Angels Security, this is what really sealed the deal with the angels and my grandfather, who subsequent, subsequently became known as the Rev. <laughs> um, the, the head of Hell's Angels Security, who my grandfather described as the largest human being he'd ever seen in his life, this giant of a man, came up to him and said, you know, Rev, if you ever need protection, my grandfather just cut him off. He said, I never need protection. And they're like, whoa, <laughs> smoke us all. <laughs> they started showing up at his house to get married, to get counseling, to christen their babies. Outcasts who nobody else gave a crap about, or everybody else was afraid of. See, 
I think there's something extraordinary about fearless service. I think when you can summon all your courage and go into uncomfortable places and uncomfortable circumstances with total comfort and uh, deep understanding and appreciation, you can, work, you can work magic. You can work magic with people. And so that's my example. That, that's what I hold up in my own mind as good service. I'm not saying everybody needs to become a minister to the hell's angels. I'm just suggesting that, it's, that service is this wonderful way to reach across all kinds of cognitive and other boundaries and find commonality. And I think there's something else to it that's important in the psychedelic scene. Psychedelics, as you know, are tremendously amplifying. Everything's big. And it is very easy, as some other people have pointed out, to get an overblown sense of self. Now, my, my simple rule is any time we imagine ourselves to be somehow greater than others, that's delusional, pure and simple. That's idiot thinking. We need to stop that. But serving others helps to tamp down those inclinations. Serving others helps us to establish or maintain, keep keep going basic empathy and compassion. And I believe that as part of a healthy psychedelic dharma, as part of carrying the gifts and the benefits and the virtues and the insights and the understandings of what we gain in the psychedelic space into the world, that serving others, whether you do it as an educator, you do it as a therapist, you do it as somebody who's serving food. You know, I mean, the people out here who've been serving the food all day long, They've been serving us like mad, working themselves just like constantly, beautifully, without expectation of anything other than a smile. That's great service too. So I believe that as part of a psychedelic dharma, as part of a takeaway, in addition to carrying the medicine, that serving others in any of a variety of forms is something that we can bring forward and keep that vitality, keep that spirit, keep that liveliness and that illumination of the medicine alive in our actions, in our works. And, and lastly, a principle that I really believe in is seeking refuge in love. Seeking refuge in love. Um, this is a crowd that does not need a whole lot of lecturing about love being the only worthy thing there is, I think. You know, there's love and there's absolutely everything else. And uh, for sure, nothing reaches people like real, real love. Nothing is more valuable in our lives than the love that we share with friends, the love that we share with family, the love we have for the world, the love we have for wildlife, for the environment. This is, this is the most illuminating factor we can possibly carry in our lives. Um, Zoe and I had a wonderful experience in the Amazon a bunch of years ago. Uh, we, when we are in ayahuasca ceremonies, you know, we're on, we're on mats beside each other and often we'll reach over and just catch each other's hands and hold hands for a while, and this, you know, and they got this whole thing in some centers about, you know, don't touch others because you don't want to spread your energy, and we're like, yeah, let's touch each other to spread our energy. So, yeah, we have a very different sense of it. And, um, but I had intentionally said to the ayahuasca, I actually get this uh, anaconda that shows up a lot that talks with me, I talk with it, it does sometimes terrible and strange things to me. Um, it, it swallowed me one time, that was strange. I swallowed it in return, that was equally strange. Um, you know, sometimes it'll just hover here and, and I'll say things to it like, go ahead, hit me with your best shot, I'm ready. And sometimes it does. And maybe I was ready, maybe I wasn't. Um, but so I was, I had said to the ayahuasca, you know, please show me my, you know, my plant spirit allies. But Zoe and I were lying there side by side and this magnificent ceremony was happening. And, uh, you know, I just found myself like totally suffused with not only love for Zoe, but just cosmic love and this whole sense of 
reaching out to all of humanity and all sensate creatures everywhere and just wanted to send that vibe and that energy and that goodness as much as possible to everything. And the ayahuasca came along and said, so, you know, would you, would you like to see your plant spirit allies now? I said, no, no, not right now, you know, a little later. So, so we're lying there and bathed in love and it's light and snakes and all the stuff that's happening in ayahuasca and it's just ecstatic and amazing and you know a big tractor beam of heart you know heart light blasting out of my chest and it had that hum like the lightsabers that mm, yeah but it was this big okay and just wow and the ayahuasca came to me and said so uh you know would you like to see your plant spirit allies now and I said, no, no, not right now. <laughs> so more tractor beam of love, more emanating to all of humanity, more I want to be a bodhisattva, all the usual stuff. <laughs> and uh, the ayahuasca came to me and asked me a third time, and I said no. Um, but I was a little ir irritated that time, actually, I have to say, because it was an interruption of the whole love bath. <laughs> and um, so this went on for a while and on for a while, just bathing in cosmic bliss and love and deep appreciation and compassion and understanding for all beings and all things. And the ayahuasca came a fourth time and said, so, would you like to see your plant spirit allies now? And I said, no, I don't want to see my plant spirit allies. I'm here bathed in love. Isn't this where we're supposed to be in the first place? And the ayahuasca said, good choice. And that was, uh, that was the lesson. Good choice. Love is always a good choice. I had the opportunity many years ago when I lived in a yoga ashram. Uh, the head of the Swami order of India, uh, a man in charge of 500,000 monks, came to our ashram for three weeks. And I wish I could say that everybody in the ashram was really all embracing, but they just were not. They were pretty snotty about it because he wasn't part of our team and he wasn't part of our trip. He wasn't part of our particular way of doing things. And I didn't care about that. When he showed up at the door of the ashram, he handed me this card and it said, Shri Shri Swami Vedavyasananda 1008, the great yogi of the Himalayas. And I laughed out loud and gave him a hug. And he was like totally bewildered and like, what just happened? And, we, and from that point on, we were kind of inseparable for three weeks. Uh, the first uh, afternoon he was there, I was in my room and he, he came to me and he stood at my doorway. He said, there is a problem. I said, what's the problem, Swamiji? He said, follow me. So I followed him down the hall to the bathroom and he pointed accusingly at the toilet. He had apparently peed in there. And he stood there and he said, it does not clean itself. I thought, this is a guy who doesn't know flush toilets. Okay, I don't want to embarrass him. He is Sri Sri Swami Veda Vyasananda 1008, the great yogi of the Himalayas. <laughs> so I stood there with him, examining the problem. Hmm. Yeah, definitely. Huh. Hey, Swamiji, have you tried this? I reach over and I flush the toilet, right? And, he's, and, and he, you know, he held his composure. He knew what was going on. He goes, oh, very good, very good. I left, because I knew what was coming next. 20 minutes of him standing there flushing the toilet. <laughs> like a little kid, like, wow, that is so freaking amazing. I'm gonna tell them about this back in the Himalayas. This is remarkable stuff. The thing about Swamiji, he had this incredible background, extraordinary background. He knew all the scriptures. He was a very learned scholar. He, he had studied extensively and practiced yoga since his teens. He was a meditation master. He was a lovely guy. We really didn't talk about that much of that. We mostly sat around drinking tea, and I'd take him for rides. And he was funny, he was funny. He'd get into the car and he'd go, bind me. That meant put on my seatbelt. <laughs> okay, Swamiji, so I'd bind him. We'd get to the destination, he'd go, unbind me now. I say, Swamiji, you know, you can do this. He'd go, no, 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 you do it. 
Okay. Okay. All right. All right. Blessed Swami Veda Vyasananda Saraswati 1008. So the point of all this was that the only thing he did then at 83 years of age was emanate love. He didn't care what we talked about. He was happy for a walk in the country. He was funny in a walk in the country. I brought him and two young guys up to the mountains of North Georgia. This is an 83-year-old man in robes and those little buffalo sandals, you know, that have the little hole for the big toe, uh, big toe and otherwise they're just gonna flap like that. He got out of that station wagon and he took off like a rocket up the mountain. I mean, like, whoa, because he spent his entire life in the Himalayas so he could really move. And we struggled to keep up with it. I didn't struggle so much, but my friends were absolutely behind. He just had such tremendous power in the mountains. But the thing that impressed me the most was he was just all about the goodness, just all about sharing the love. After all the study, after all the yoga, after all the meditation, after all the discourse, after all the you know, careful guidance, all of that, it all boiled down to one simple thing being a loving being. And I personally believe that while we do not need psychedelics to be loving beings, I do believe that the world in which we live is so filled with distraction and so filled with distress and so filled with trouble that we also benefit greatly from these deep, nourishing dives into the pellucid pool of psychedelic intelligence, the way these agents naturally help us to order inside. You know, as I, I like to quote that Hawaiian elder that true healing puts into order the body, mind, and spirit with the past, present, and future. And that remembrance, especially when we have those deep love immersions rather than when we're getting our, you know, being eaten from, from the ass on to our heads by psychedelic hyenas. Um, you know, when we have these love experiences, they refresh us. They, they put the joy in enjoyment. They give us a sense of vitality that is irreplaceable. And then we go back, I mean, when, how many people here bathe on a daily basis? <laughs> Only a few, okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> How many people bathe at least occasionally? <laughs> all right, all right. Still only a few, and that's worrisome. <laughs> I really wasn't expecting that. I thought a unanimous vote here. It's like a unanimous vote for impeachment. Yes, but in, in any case, but you don't stay in the shower all day long. You shower, you're clean, you go out, you do your thing. We go into this pool of refreshment with the psychedelics. We go into this often in community with each other, in ceremonies with each other. And we get that deep, profound, powerful spiritual refreshment. And then we can carry ourselves out into the world with more energy and more strength and more cohesion and a sense of brilliance to us. So I would submit to you that carrying the medicine in any and all ways that are appropriate to you in the circumstances of your life, that serving others in any and all ways that are appropriate to your talents and your position and your interests, and also seeking refuge in love, the only worthy thing, that these can help us to move forward in wonderful ways and do what we all want to do, make a wonderful and positive contribution. Thank you so much for listening to me. Thanks, man.